Thank you all for um, having me here. Um, I'm happy to uh, see you all and to be here practicing together. Um, I want to ask you to let me know if my microphone starts to make scratchy noises against my scarf. Will you let me know? Because just the other day I recorded, a, I gave a whole hour long talk and it was rubbing the whole time. And I only discovered at the end when I heard the recording. So um, I don't want to have extra noises in your ear. Um, is the sound coming through okay right now? Great. So I'd love to uh, hear a little bit from you before we um, get too much into the topic today. Um, would love to just know um, where you're calling in from, what your gender pronouns are, um, if you know the native lands that you're on. I'm calling in from Long Island in New York, the land of the Muncie, Lenape, and Merrick peoples. Um, you could put that in the chat. But also, if you wouldn't a mind to share, what is it that you're bringing with you today? What is it that you're, you know, needing or um, curious about? Or, yeah, what spoke to you about the title or... Um, or just maybe this is just your weekly dose of Dharma. That's great too. So just yeah, share a little bit about in a sentence or so what's bringing you here today. And uh, I'll read out what, what you all share in the chat. So um, your, your gender pronouns, I guess we, we see everyone's name um, because it's listed under our video, but you could share your name, your gender pronouns where you're calling in from. Amazing that we have someone calling in from Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, so, uh, and then what's the fourth thing is what's something that you're wishing for, curious about, bringing, um, wanting in a sentence or so. I'll just... I'll read some of the sharings coming in. Um, needing optimism and clear seeing. I'm here to take refuge and learn to do it with tenderness, given the chaos in my life right now. Thank you. Need to practice. Welcoming the chance to practice with you. Thank you. Feeling resistance to what unfolds. Thank you. And from France, lovely. We welcome you to the room. I need equanimity to accept whatever the election results are. I am anxious and nervous, not just for me, but for future generations. I'm also here to take refuge. Thank you, Claudia. Trying to maintain equanimity and a long view. Thank you. Oh, so it's Halloween, happy Halloween. <laughs> That's our, we're dog sitting and as the children come by trick or treating, our little dog is gonna bark, so. That's what that is. Um, 
needing to keep being kind. I first met you at a retreat where you helped me with self-love. Thank you. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Thank you so much. Good to see you again. Um, I want to join your community this evening for my Dharma fix. <laughs> so calling in from the west of Ireland. This is lovely. Thank you. Very international here, even a small group. Beautiful. Okay. The time has already... Uh, so finding equanimity and reaching out for broader connection. Beautiful. Yeah, and, and some of us are in more restricted situations now with COVID as the cases spike. So dealing with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of change and stress, perhaps with COVID, with the elections. Thank you all for sharing. It's good to get a sense of who, who we are here together on this call. Feel free to keep uh, sharing. Oh, there is some, oh yeah, thank you for letting me know. Let me adjust that and see if it gets better. Is there still rustling now? Has it got better? Okay, great, thanks. So feel free to share if you haven't yet. So I just, kind of feel like checking in to ask you all. <laughs> I can share two different things. And I had prepared to come and share about navigating uncertainty in general. But I also just gave a, a practice session a few days ago on um, open hearted election practice. And so if that would be more appropriate, we can we can oh, switch the direction of tonight, or maybe we maybe that will also sort of be covered in, in the navigating uncertainty in general. But if um, I know not everyone's from the U.S., not everyone is gnawing on their fingernails uh, for what's happening in the next week over here in the U.S., but I just offer that in case that would be more appropriate for this group. So um, if you have a strong feeling, either way, you could put it in the chat. It may not be that we get a clear picture from uh, <laughs> people sharing, but I thought I would just put it out there. So any input from you all? This is part of the uncertainty that we're <laughs> practicing to face and navigate. What would you, what would be most helpful, do you feel, for you? You could just answer for yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's, Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting many, some privately to me, some all to the group that it's people would like to keep the general flow, the general, any kind of uncertainty. It can include the election, but not limited to the election. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you for that feedback. So um, the meditation I wanna offer us first and then I'll offer some reflections. Um, comes from a teaching from root teacher and Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, or Thai as we lovingly call him, which is teacher in Vietnamese. So people would often ask 
Thai what to do when facing big life decisions, like what career path to take or whether to separate or stay with their partner or whether to ordain as a monastic. And so they were basically asking like, how do I deal with the not knowing, with not knowing what I should do or, or also not knowing what life is going to bring me and how should I respond in that situation when I don't know what's gonna come next down the pipe, so to speak. What do I do when I'm facing uncertainty? And so Ty would often say, don't try to figure out the answer by thinking about it. And that's usually what we do when we're unsure. We go into our heads to try to figure it out. And it doesn't mean that thinking is wrong or bad or that we shouldn't think. Sometimes we can get to some good solutions when we let ourselves ponder um, with our minds. But especially when it's a very um, deep question and many possibilities could be um, viable. Um, and there's an emotional pull, like it's really important um, to us. And um, and we're stuck because, you know, there's real skin in the game in many different, out, you know, possible outcomes and many different um, paths we could take. Um, we don't usually get very far trying to think our way to a solution. And, and just, you know, to back up and say, anytime we're facing uncertainty, our nervous system registers that as a threat. The mind, the human mind wants to have certainty. That's when it can feel safe. We always wanna feel safe. Our reptilian brain is looking for safety first and foremost. And having some idea of what's gonna happen is how we stay safe. So just any situation where we don't know what's gonna happen, whether it's pan the pandemic, whether it's the election, whether it's, you know, what do I do next month about my job or my apartment or my partner or my child or whatever it is, my health, what's gonna happen? You know, that is very challenging for humans to be with because um, there's this belief we have that we can only feel okay when we know what's going to happen. But I'll share about this later in the talk. That's actually not the case. We can actually find some respite and some refuge when we don't know what's going to happen. So, so Ty would say in these times of being asked, um, how do I, you know, how do I respond to this moment of uncertainty? He would say, it's not by thinking that you're going to get there. And rather, you know, because you can really tire yourself out trying to think your way to an answer. Your mind gets more confused, more anxious. And that these kind of deeper life questions, deeper conundrums, um, they can't be answered at the level of the mind. They, they have to be approached at a deeper place. Um, they have to be entrusted to this part of our consciousness that we call store consciousness. It's actually much more powerful than our mind consciousness. We have parts of our brain that can um, hold something like a seed and take good care of it and not mess with it and just let the seed sprout when it's ready to sprout. Our mind can't do that. Our mind rolls it over sleep because it's trying to figure it out trying to figure it out and we wake up exhausted further from a deeper understanding of what we should do so 
So Tai would say, consider this question as a seed that you entrust into the soil of your mind and you let it rest there. And what does that seed need in order to sprout? It needs mindfulness. So our daily mindfulness practice is what helps the seed to ripen over time. It's, that's the warmth, the sun that actually gives that seed the conditions to in, in time sprout up. And when we let our store consciousness hold that question, or even it could just be our anxiety, like with the election, it's not like, what should I do this or that? We, we made our decision. Now it's like, what's going to happen? But we can put into the soil, soil of our mind, our anxiety, our fear, our worry, or our own question, you know, how, how am I going to deal with what's going to happen with the election? That could be the seed that goes into the soil of our mind. So we're asking this wise and patient part of ourselves to hold and help us come up with a way to face the situation that comes from real wisdom, which isn't found when we um, go into rumination and, you know, this cycle of thinking and because that just stirs up storm just gets worse and we just have more fear more anxiety so the idea is to put the seed down into the level of our you know this lower level of our mind just let it rest there so we can in our meditation we can ask we can come to the question what is the question and we say now i'm entrusting this to my you know deeper awareness to hold this question and I'm gonna leave it there. I'm not gonna keep trying to figure out the answer. I'm just gonna leave it there. Because a seed won't grow if you keep uncovering it to see how it's, <laughs> how it's doing. You have to leave it covered, right? So we let it stay down there. And in our daily lives, we practice our practice of resting, coming home to ourselves, being in the present moment, being responsive to the situations around us, the people around us, doing our practice. And that's what will allow this question to, on its own, we'll just know the answer. It's not because we did a lot of mental work and gymnastics to figure it out. It will just arrive. And I have experienced this. I have experienced being in a place of real painful and dis orienting, not knowing, and staying with that, and staying with that, and staying with that, and then knowing, ah, one day, it just came. And it wasn't because I worked it out up here. Something down here had matured enough for the answer to arise all by itself. Literally all by itself. So it's a big trust practice. It's a letting go practice. It's a renunciation of trying to think our way um, through the problem, through the question. Because we really can trust the store consciousness. That it, it can do that job, just like the earth is able to um, provide the conditions for a seed to sprout. And just to say, when we get caught up in our catastrophizing and like, I really need to know, I have to figure this out. I can't just, I don't have time or this is, it's not going to work to just let this stay down there. Um, that's, you know, if we feed the worry, if we feed the fear, it's muddying the waters. It's making it harder to get to our clarity and our clarity is there if we let we let things be still that the mud will settle and we will see um, see more clearly so we can breathe we can feel our body we can touch into what's happening in the present moment and then we find our solidity our 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 some kind of center that helps us find our way but but that only can come to us 
if we let go of trying to figure it out in our heads. So it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, I went I went to a museum exhibit with my mom many years ago, and it was about the brain, and they had something about relaxation, this activity where you put these electrodes on your forehead and you had a partner you were competing against. And however much you relaxed was how quickly your ball moved towards the center. So you were competing <laughs> with your partner to relax more. So it was a very counterintuitive thing that you, you know, who could be the fastest to relax, they would win. So it's like that, you know, the more you can let go of trying to get an answer, the easier it will be to find your answer. So let's do a little practice. Um, we're gonna practice letting the seed rest in the soil of our mind, whatever the seed is. So finding a comfortable position. Maybe just, you could just move around a little bit before we settle in, you could look around. You could stretch your arms, stretch your legs, yawn, make a big face, and just feel your body. And when you're ready, as you settle into your position, Noticing how your body is making contact with the chair, with the floor, whatever you're supported by. And allowing yourself to rest back in some way to just feel the support of what's holding you. Every time you exhale, let your body rest even more into the support of the earth. Allow your face to soften, releasing the forehead muscles around the eyes, the jaw. Let your tongue rest in the mouth. Be aware of the shoulders and as you breathe out, let the shoulders soften. Bring attention to the chest and the belly. Allow them to release and soften, especially as you exhale. You can hold a lot of tension there without knowing it. Noticing your arms, your hands, and letting them grow heavier, just releasing tightness there. And now feel your legs and your feet. And as you exhale, softening, letting go and down to your feet, your legs. Now feel your whole body as you inhale and exhale. Allowing the whole body to soften, to release its weight even more onto the earth.
Now bring to mind some question or challenge or conflict you may be experiencing in your life right now. Get a feel for it and how it's operating in you, how it's affecting you. And without trying to figure out an answer or a solution, see it now taking shape as a seed that you are entrusting to the soil of your mind down in its depths. Let it lay there peacefully, quietly. Let yourself rest back into the unknown. While it may be scary not to know, there is also infinite possibility in this place of not knowing. Continue breathing in awareness. Feeling your body, letting your body settle and become present. And giving the seed permission to take all the time it needs to ripen into an answer. Trust your own consciousness to show you the way when the time is right. You may like to practice this meditation from Thich Nhat Hanh that says, breathing in, the Buddha is in me. Breathing out, I have confidence. The Buddha is in me. I have confidence. It means the capacity of awakening is my nature. I can trust this. We can each have confidence in this 
wisdom. It's there in each of us. Let yourself breathe and open to this truth of your own ability to access presence, wisdom, patience, ease, even in the midst of uncertainty. You can do this. Trust, resilience, wisdom is my nature. I have confidence. Visualizing a seed resting in the lower layers of your mind. And also knowing that one day the answer will be clear. And feeling in your body how that, how that feels to have the answer already. to be on the other side of this conundrum, this conflict, this question. Open up to that real possibility. How that feels. And letting yourself rest now. Let yourself just be. Opening to what is here and now. Patient. Trusting. You will have what you need when you need it. The flower can't be rushed into blooming. It blooms in its own time when the conditions are sufficient. Let yourself rest. Rest back. Lao Tzu asks us, 
Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? I entrust myself, I entrust myself to the earth, to the earth, and she trusts herself to me. I entrust myself, I entrust myself to life, to life, and life entrusts itself to me. Thank you for your practice. Take your time to slowly transition. You can gently open your eyes and bring movement back into your body. And feel free to stand and stretch if that's helpful for you. Um, I will just move right into sharing um, but at any point when we're together feel free to take care of your body if that means lying down or standing or moving um, changing your position um, feel free to do that So, so I have some stories to share about uh, navigating uncertainty, surrendering uh, to the unknown, and holding ourselves tenderly in these times. So. Some years ago, um, as Noam mentioned, I was a nun for 15 years in the Plum Village community. And I was trying to discern 
uh, whether or not to leave monastic life. After having spent my whole adult life from 25 to 40 um, in the community, and or in robes and um and at that time i um attended silent retreats at the insight meditation society in massachusetts um so it was the longer three-month retreats or the half of that was six-week retreat and it was a really important time of pausing for me to look deeply, to come home to myself. I felt I needed to be outside of the community to ask this really important question because within the community there would be too much of a feeling of, you know, wanting, wanting to please, wanting to... continue and not giving myself the real space to ask the fullness of the question. So, so those times at IMS were, were really powerful in terms of letting my consciousness just take its time to find the way. And when I decided to ordain at the age of 25 as a nun, in my heart, I was intending to do that for my whole life. That was my intention. So it was confusing and painful to be having this, these doubts, this questioning of, of this vow that I assumed I would carry for my entire life. And I, I really didn't want to get it wrong. It was really important not to mess this up, you know. <laughs> And, um, and in this time of transition of like asking myself questions that I never, never allowed myself to ask, I didn't know who I was anymore. Like I didn't know who I might become if I would leave. And it was, it was terrifying. It was, it was like this caterpillar that has to dissolve into this soup <laughs> to become a butterfly. Um, you know, in the chrysalis, there's like, it's total chaos. It's just everything breaking down. And, you know, there's not yet, maybe, maybe the caterpillar knows, so it's calm. And no, I don't know. Maybe they, they have more uh, fortune than we, we do as humans. But it was very uncomfortable for me because I wanted answers. I wanted clarity. I was used to knowing what I was up until then in my whole life. I knew what I was going to be doing. I knew, okay, I'm going to college. Okay, now I'm going to find the spiritual teacher, the spiritual community. Okay, now I'm in this community. I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. Now I was kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what am I supposed to be doing. And so Joseph Goldstein was one of my interview teachers, so supportive and helpful. And when I shared how distressing it was to find myself with no solid ground under me whatsoever, he, he was very equanimous. <laughs> he would say things like, well, look at your life up until now. You've been okay. You know, like you've managed all the different transitions you've gone through. Like, you know, and so that perspective I didn't have. But he also mentioned Alan Watts' book, The Wisdom of Insecurity. And I didn't ever read the book, but the title has always stayed with me. And he, he said, you know, it points out this book that when we are clear and sure about what we're doing, when we know what the outcome of the election is going to be, <laughs> Whatever it is, when we have that knowledge, we can't be open to the many other possibilities that are available. We actually get limited. But when we let ourselves hang out in this space of not knowing, there's enormous potential. And we, we're open to the fact that, you know, life could unfold in many different ways, innumerable ways. So rather than avoid and fear the uncertainty, we can actually embrace it and 
appreciate what it's offering us, the gifts of this not knowing. And so what I found on these long retreats was not an answer to what I should do. I, I never got an answer on the retreat, but I did, you know, about whether just roving or should I stay a nun, should I leave? But I did find the ability to dwell more and more comfortable, comfortably in the not knowing. I learned to let this seed of this question rest in the deeper layers of my consciousness. And I was able to touch peace and to touch joy and well being, even in the midst of the awkwardness of not knowing and that confusion. It was like there was space for that, and there was space for other things too. I didn't push it away, like I have to figure this out. I can't be at peace until I was like, okay, yeah, it's here. I don't know. Let me just be with that. So I learned to let go of the fear of the resistance as I was in the midst of dissolving and losing my identity. I wasn't pushing that away. So I was slowing down. Rather than speed up to try to figure it out, we can slow down. We can rest back into the uncertainty rather than pushing against it, rather than fighting it, rather than leaning forward into the future to try to look and see what's coming. We can actually rest back. And so, so by slowing down, by, by you know, letting myself just be in that place, I was able to touch a sense of space exactly in the moments when it felt like I didn't know how I could keep going and that I would be totally overwhelmed right in those moments where it was so tight, where I felt so much internal pressure. If I could just open to that experience, I could feel more space. I could feel more possibility. So if we can breathe in and breathe out, and put our mind on our present moment experience, we can create that space that allows us to be okay in the midst of that not knowing. So we slow down, we let our nervous system recalibrate, recenter. And the external situation might not change, but we've changed our relationship to the external situation. Yeah. If we can stop, we have the chance to touch into something deeper than the overwhelm. The overwhelm can still be there, but there's something else there also that's not overwhelm. And it's, it's there to be known and to be um, accessed. If we don't identify completely with the overwhelm, if we get space around the overwhelm, we say, yes, overwhelm, you're here. But just like that leaning back, I actually do it physically in my meditation. I actually lean back a little bit to give whatever overwhelming experience I'm having more space. It's like, you, you can be here and I can give you more space. so that I can touch that there's something more than just overwhelm. That's that ability to give it space is, is the, the mindfulness, the equanimity that allows us to be with the overwhelm without getting completely overwhelmed. So that's this practice of pausing, of stopping. That's what helps this seed of our question of our difficulty to mature and to ripen into the guidance and the direction that we need. And so in the, in the present moment, I can know how things are. I can't know what will be in the future, but in the present, I do know I do know what's happening with my breath, with my body, 
with my thoughts, with my emotions. And the wonderful thing is that the future is a continuation of the present. What is the future but an extension of the present moment? The future is made of the present. So if we can take care of the present by being here, by knowing what's happening right here and now, which is all we really need to know, then we're taking care of the future. If we can come home to ourselves in this moment, then that's the content of the future. That's the matter with which the future take shape. So rather than worrying and scheming and trying to control and predict, I can relax, I can touch real profound ease right here, right now. That's the best way to attract whatever future that I want. It's the best way to prepare is by letting go of trying to make something happen. So I can best take care of the future by taking good care of this moment. And, and we've seen how flawed this attempt to predict and guess and see into the future can be. I mean, just four years ago in the election, the presidential election, you know, the predictions were very different from the outcome that happened. So that's not the place to take refuge. And I, I, as I see it, in the sense our culture, our society is dissolving, we're entering collectively a chrysalis Structures we've come to rely on and identify with are breaking down and we don't know what the next phase will be like. Like kids going to school, that never was something that didn't happen in my whole life. Come September, kids were always going back to school. This is not the reality anymore in many places around the country many places around the world. So things that we thought were not going to change are changing and, and the new form isn't clear yet. So we're in this cocoon, um, like as a species, there's climate change, there's huge change that's coming very fast. So learning to surrender, to let go in our own lives, in this space of the unknown is essential to our collective learning to move through this time of faster and faster change and disruption and upheaval. So I love this quote from an article, Kitisaro and Tanisara were interviewed in the Sun magazine. This was some years ago. The title of the article was A Mindful Marriage in the Sun magazine. But in, he's talking in this section about how, what he learned from illness. And so this is a time of great collective illness. So um, Kiji Saro says, illness wasn't a teacher I would have chosen. But there was nothing I do about it. Until that point, I had basically been able to accomplish whatever I wanted through willpower, study, and persistence. I'd been able to bend circumstances to my desires. My sense of self was intimately connected with my success. Then I spent years struggling with chronic pain, 
overpowering weakness, digestive disorders, internal bleeding, and so on. Though I saw doctors and healers and underwent myriad treatments, I couldn't overcome the illness. Unable to participate in the normal monastic routine, I felt like a failure. Fortunately, the Buddha taught that sickness, old age, and death are heavenly messengers and that to live in denial of these truths results in suffering. My illness taught me how to die. In other words, how to surrender to what I couldn't change and how to make peace with the painful and confused states of body and mind that I encountered. My capacity for patience deepened and in moments when I wasn't feeling sorry for myself or wishing my life were otherwise, I discovered that there is a deep part of ourselves that is never sick, that never dies. That unyielding illness which refused to follow my orders brought me to a place where I lost everything I thought I was. Then I found what remains, which no one can take away. So there's immense richness in this experience of the not knowing, of the not being able to control, of being forced to let go, to re reimagine, re envision everything. And to me, the, the best way to meet it is to soften this word tenderness, you know. So I'm, I just invite us all as we close this part of our time together to let your body physically soften. Just right now in your posture, just see how you can just invite this letting, letting go, this opening to, not pushing against, not stiffening up against the the discomfort of the not knowing. And if we do find ourselves stiffening, resisting, then allowing that, softening around that. Okay, here's resistance, here's stiffening. Can I open to that? Can I rest in that, not pushing that away? So just let's consciously just invite this sense of opening to, softening, dissolving into soup. <laughs> and then we'll listen to a sound of bell. Thank you for your attention. Um, and now we have time for sharing, for your questions, for your reflections, comments. Um, complaints. Whatever you'd like to share. Um, that's the link to that. Uh, article from Kitisaro and Tanisara with that passage on illness. So you can write your question in the chat. You can ask it by unmuting yourself. You could share.
Thank you for sharing that, Noam. I was struck by the idea that when we shut down uncertainty, we are limiting our experience of the possibilities. I appreciated that you said that the future is not a place to take refuge because I feel like that's where I'm always looking to take it like if it's because I keep thinking like depending on who gets elected you know yeah I'll feel so happy one way or so upset the other way and and really nothing has changed in my life and I isn't that funny that I would feel so different given something that, you know, that doesn't change my immediate moment to moment existence, you know, just, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm always looking for refuge in the future. And um, it's good to be reminded. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rita. Um, I mean, I think it's true that we You know, we really only can live in the present. We can't live in the future. We can't live in the past, right? Or, or we can and, and we sacrifice the life that we've been given if we try to live in the future, or live in the past. But I'd also say that um, You know, whether you feel the outcome of the election affects you personally a lot or not, like it's, it's good to, um, to see ourselves as part of the whole also that will definitely um, be deeply impacted by whoever ends up being in the White House. And so without throwing away our, our home in the present, we can also really know that, you know, there will be a big difference <laughs> if, it, if it turns out one way versus the other way. And so we wanna be really ready to be responsive to the ways that it's, it will be, it has been difficult and it will get harder for lots of people on the margins and in vulnerable places in our society. If, you know, the current occupant of the White House stays, stays on. Or, or, or figures out, you know, unfair ways to stay on that will have huge impacts that will, you know, so just to say, like, whether or not we feel that's going to affect us a lot individually, it will have a huge effect on, and it doesn't mean that everything will get better if the president changes either, right? I mean, that's an unknown as well. But but I think we, we can stay in the present while also really knowing that um, should things continue to slide down and down and down, we, we have work to do. And we can still be in the zone as we engage in work. And we will have work to do regardless, whoever ends up getting elected. You know, and it's about opening our hearts to engage compassionately with those that are, are really not being cared for in our society. So I just wanted to add that perspective. Thank you, Rita. Um, Helen has added to the chat. I, that was beautiful. I became soup for a moment. <laughs> the potential of uncertainty, the wisdom of insecurity, the experience of not knowing, being forced to let go, 
to reimagine everything. Sowing the seed in the store consciousness. Thank you so much. That was a lovely teaching. We are very much with you all in the US through this time. Thank you. All the way from Ireland. Uh, Scotland, sorry. Yeah. Hi, could I share something? Yes, please. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, I'm a teacher. I, I teach uh, at a community college and I, I, uh, I, I really agree with you that being in the present is all I really can do. And I always have this thought that, you know, that the future really everybody's dead anyway. So it's really <laughs> to keep going into the future is my, you know, I'm dead, my kids are dead, my grandkids are dead, like humanity's dead. So when I step back, this election isn't that big a deal at that from that perspective. But at the same time, when I'm in my class and I have students who are you know, I'm not, I'm actually personally not affected so much what happened, but my students, I have DACA students, I have stu international students, I have students, students of color who are, you know, who are going through the injustice and, and I have to find a place really sometimes to not just get so angry that I'd lose my, you know, my own serenity. I'm also in recovery. And just to be, you know, to keep practicing kindness. I even, you know, I, I especially, you know, in my in my recovery meetings, I know there are people who are voting both ways, and and yeah. I don't I don't have the luxury of being kind just to people who think the way I do. Mm -hmm. I have to be kind to all, and that's a that's a challenge sometimes when I see the injustice and people I know, you know, students. Yeah. We're deeply affected. That's a struggle for me. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for your, mm. I really appreciate everything mm. you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. I appreciate what you do too. It's very important to be holding space and showing up for your students and your recovery folks as well. Um, and I think it's beautiful the way you phrase that. I think you said, I don't have the luxury to be kind only to people who think the way I do. And um, it, that is a luxury <laughs> to, to, to be able to to pick and choose and it's it's not a good luxury to have i don't think i think it's a very helpful to be um challenged with you know how to open ourselves and love love people whoever they are and and it's a real i can really feel the the point of tension you're 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 expressing when you see folks that are really harmed by the policies of our current government. And then you're, you know, in meetings with people who are supporting those policies, but who you are deeply interwoven with at the same time. And I think that's the case for many folks who have friends or family members who are voting, you know, differently than they are. And, um, you know, and it's not always, you know, you can't always, and it's not always the, well, you know, those aren't people that just love your lives because you don't think the way they do. Um, you know, one of the things that I feel is really meaningful is having people hear each other's stories. And um, a friend of mine shared with me about what, what helped Florida turn uh, to approve gay marriage, to um, pass legislation, was a very grassroots work of people who were either LGBTQIA themselves or family members of 
who would just knock on people's doors and tell them their stories, tell them about the people in their lives that they loved, who were queer or queer people themselves, just knocking on people's door and telling them why, why it was important for them that they, you know, that this lobby passed. And it got passed. Enough people heard enough stories of the heart that, that shifted, you know. Um, and there's an organization that I've, I've heard about. I haven't gone to their, um, they have like a kind of living room. It's called, I think it's called living room conversations, but they have a different theme each month and they invite people from all different backgrounds from all over the political spectrum. And you don't know who's who, but you're just sharing about this topic from the heart. That's, that's what, how the day unfolds is everyone tells their stories from the heart about whatever the topic is for the day. And only at the end of the day do you, you know, kind of get to understand where, you know, what people's political affiliations are. But the way they organize these conversations apparently really helps people to learn something <laughs> and be open to other perspectives, right? And I'm sure on both sides, on all sides. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, finding, you know, finding ways to help folks who are supporting policies that we see as harmful, you know, finding ways for them to be in touch with not, not our dogma, not our ideology, but like stories, you know, is, is maybe one, one approach, one way to not just be like, to feel helpless in the face of being, you know, belonging to these two different communities that are, where one is actually harming the other, right? That's, the, that's what's happening, right? One way of supporting what's happening in the country is harming groups of people. And so, if we're connected to these groups of people that are being harmed, we do have a responsibility to sow some seeds of, of some kind of compassion or understanding, or it's not that these folks don't have compassion, but you know, there's some disconnect and there's a lot of manipulation happening, you know, so. You know, I think all of that can, can be done with great respect, with, with great love. But I, I think we, we can't afford to shy away from it. We don't have the luxury, as you said, to not, um, you know, be courageous and have like those folks showing up on people's doorsteps to tell their stories. You know? And that's, this is a work of, of a lifetime, not just for this election, right? Thank you. I have a question about, I love the idea of planting the seed and then not forcing a flower to bloom. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot this year in particular is the balance between inner work and outer work. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of the middle way or knowing when to swing the pendulum between kind of this like patient internal work on our own responsivity versus knowing when it's time to take action in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> I 
you know, I like to ask my body. I think there's a lot of wisdom in the body. There's this phrase, the body never lies. And so sometimes just, you know, presenting to yourself, okay, well, how do I respond when I think of getting engaged right now in something? Or how do, how do I respond when I think of becoming quiet in order to listen? And then just seeing what do your, does your body, what does your, you know, what bubbles up? What, what is your body saying yes to when you present, when you ask it this question, you know? It's like muscle testing. It's this uh, kin kinesiology where you, you hold this medicine, the, the doctor who does this you know, gives you the medicine, or maybe it's a piece of fruit or something you might be allergic to. They're trying to figure out. So you hold it or you hold it to your chest or you hold it, put your arm out. And if, if your arm stays strong, then that thing is okay for you. But if they're pushing and your arm goes down, that's not a good thing for you. Um, so you, you have your own, you know, muscle testing, diagnostic, uh, right? Just in what, how your body responds to, to, you know, this question of what, which one, you know? Um, and I'd also say, just to make it more complicated, <laughs> the two things are intertwined, you know? Like, you can be engaging in a way that is internally still. You can move and be still in the movement. Like, you can do some service whatever, do some action, but be very present. You can come inward and listen in a way that is very engaged. For, for me, I think of it as like a infinity symbol, this eight on its side. You come into your listen to the quiet and that leads you out to engage and then that leading coming out to engage leads you back in to be listening to yourself which then leads you back out and it's just this dance of like you know you know it's the feedback loop of you go out you do something if you're out of juice you gotta come resource again right if you find yourself just running on empty that you're doing stuff it doesn't bring you joy it doesn't bring you any nourishment you feel lost you feel confused you I mean, this happens a lot we can be getting active and engaged for the wrong reasons right out of guilt, out of some sense of needing to prove ourselves, out of some, you know, unexamined motivation. And that doesn't lead to actually the transformation that we want by that action. So then we need to come in and like do, do work that helps us see that pattern clearly so that that's no longer what's pushing us out. Sometimes we come out to do work to run away from inside of us. I was just watching a documentary about Krishnadas yesterday. It was very powerful. He was saying how once he started singing, he could see that he was going to get caught up in the fame and the power. More and more people were coming to him. And he knew he wasn't going to be able to sing from the place of of real um, selfless offering that he he wanted to so he left it all he went to India he just stopped and he, he did the inward turn and he went to his guru's ashram to try to get direction and sure enough at some big festival 
he had this profound experience of peace, of clarity, of transformation, where that peace in him that was like needing the admiration for himself was released. Some real shift happened. And then he was able to come back to the, to the world of making music without this need for, you know, for the self to be the focus. So, so it's the inward can really shift our ability to be effective out, outwardly. And if we don't get that part, you know, clear, then w- what we do outwardly isn't going to be very effective. And then, and then when we are effective outwardly, then we still need times to, you know, to come in, reassess, check, you know, and then always what I find when I come in and nourish myself, always that leads me, whatever I have, it's the only purpose of it is to share it. So any, any goody, you know, good stuff that happens in your inner work, it just, it takes you out. It's the only place it can go to, to fulfill itself. So to me, they're, they're not actually separate. They're on this one continuum. Thanks for the question. So there's one, um, one last thing that came into the chat. It came to me privately, um, but I'll read it out. It's, I think that as a nation, we're in turmoil facing painful issues such as racial injustice that we've been resistant to face, but that we have to. And hopefully after this process we'll become whole and healthier in the end. Yes, I so agree, Claudia, we have to, we have to face this. James Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed if it's not faced. So we definitely need to face this. And, and then, then you ask, I'm curious as to what did you, you decide in the end? Did you stay or leave monastic life? Thank you for the question. I did leave. I used to have a shaved head and wear a brown robe and I lived in a monastery and now I'm um, no longer a nun. So five years ago, I disrobed and um, And that's been a, a good a good path for me. I've not regretted that. Although I loved very dearly my monastic life, but I was being called into some other form. And, and it was a really major transition, but I'm glad I listened to that voice that was saying there's something else that needs to happen here. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the lay world. I had to pay taxes for the first time as a 40, 40 year old. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say, Claudia? I think our, our voices mixed each other. I think you are doing uh, uncertainty, then other possibilities open up. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> so I see we're, we're at time. And uh, thank you all so much for your attention, for your practice, for this cozy time of exploring uh, this topic together. And yeah, I just wish all of us, um, you know, that in this next few weeks, because who knows when there'll be a real clear result of the election that we can stay connected to our breath, to our body, to the beauty that's always there in us and around us. Stay connected to our Sangha, to the things that nourish us and support us. Um, 
because we have the resilience inside that we need and we can share it with each other and, and make it grow. So go well, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Carla. I am, uh, I, I will just say that um, tonight, this afternoon, as I keep saying tonight, this afternoon's teaching felt like one of those times where like, it's all stuff I'd heard before, but it penetrated today. And um, it, I think that's, uh, yeah, so beautiful and I appreciate you personally very much and I want to appreciate you on behalf of the Sangha. Um, I just want to welcome everyone. There are some people who are regulars and some people who are irregulars and you're all so welcome. We're, we're so happy that you're here. Um, we, uh, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is a community-led Sangha and um, you want to know more about us uh, I think Katie has put links in the chat about that we are entirely supported by donations so we appreciate what you can donate and um, we are happy that you're here regardless of the amount you can donate so thank you um, yeah tonight if you want to go for something really different we have our Monthly Death Sangha, which is a meditation on death by one of our regular teachers, Michael Taft. And for Halloween, he's doing a three hour death Sangha. That is for, by pre-registration. So um, please uh, go to our website, sfdharmacollective.org if you want to find out more. Um, this uh, talk will be on our YouTube channel where you can see other talks by us. And then I want to give um, Kyra the last word because she has some offerings coming up that I want her to share um, with Sangha. So thank you. Thank Kyra. you, Noam. I had forgotten about that. I just wanted to let you all know, um, I and Sister Haiyan, a nun in the Plum Village tradition, we have been offering a Dharma-based book study of the book my Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menikin, um, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. It's a really beautiful book. Um, really recommend you read it. And um, we planned this before George Floyd and the, the protests, the set up risings. We did a, an eight week course in the spring. We've done another second iteration this fall, nine, nine weeks. Next year, we'll be doing it in a 10 week. We feel like people need more time. Anyway, it's um, drawing on the Plum Village teachings and the Buddhist teachings to um, help us delve into this work. And it's for folks of all backgrounds, white, BIPOC folks, um, and um, getting very good feedback. So if it's of interest, it starts March through May for 10 weeks. We meet, we meet weekly in small groups. And I'll put the ad, the um, the address is restoring kinship at gmail.com for for information about this course, and it's offered on a sliding scale. So if you're interested, just email restoring kinship at gmail.com, and then we'll send you um, one more registration. We'll um, send you information. There's a bunch of people from Europe taking the course this time around also. So we're making meeting times that work for those in Europe as well. And someone put my website in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, KyraJewel.com. I have a newsletter that I have been very bad about getting out. But <laughs> if you want to sign up, I will eventually send you some news. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Love to everyone.